Let's pray the prayer of illumination. O Lord, our God, our Father, thank you for bringing us together today that we can hear your word spoken and preached. We pray for Pastor Matt as he gives your words to us that you have prepared in him. And we pray for our hearts. Please prepare them to receive your word. Help us. Apart from you, we cannot understand and know these things. We look to you to illuminate us, that your light would shine into us, and we would reflect your light to all the world. Amen. The scripture reading for today is from Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. We turn to God for salvation when we realize we do not have on our own power, or mental energy, or emotional, or whatever, the ability to save ourselves. We turned in for salvation because the world and its anemic promises are not enough for us. We turn to God because the other ways don't lead to life. But we return to him for shalom, for wholeness, for healing, for purpose and peace. In the book of Jeremiah, God encourages the people of Israel to return to him over 100 times. If you hear nothing else this morning, hear this. We turn to God for salvation and we return to him for wholeness, for healing and purpose and peace. He tends to our wounds from the past. He gives us clear eyes on him and our work in the world and the people he's put into our lives today. And he gives us confidence that he has the world and certainly our stories in the palm of his hand. After preaching uh, last week on Isaiah, it kind of feels like Isaiah and Jeremiah are good cop, bad cop. Depending on how familiar you are with the story, Isaiah is um, prophesying along... uh, Oh, in an overlapping way with Jeremiah. Jeremiah is much more gritty and down to earth. Jeremiah is from Anathoth. And we know that both because the book tells us that, but also because people from Anathoth want to beat him up because he keeps saying, return to the Lord. Meaning you're not returned to him. You're not facing him. You're not living in accordance with his ways right now. Even as Jeremiah will prophesy against Israel and Judah and also Babylon, Egypt, Moab, and and Edom. It's a very local book. There are more personal names in the book of Jeremiah than any other prophetic book. And the reason that matters is faith frees us into real life where we are. What we think is oftentimes in our mediocre moments or fatigue or perhaps our worst moments, I need something significant in my life to change. And the with God life has a far better promise that it alone can deliver, which is God in us frees us to do all the things that are already in front of us 
instead of a different life. Philippians 4.13, maybe should be on as many signs as you see, for I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, which does not mean that you can fly. It means that you can do all the things in front of you without disproportionate anxiety or fear or shame. It means that that thing that you still have nightmares about can actually be healed by holding it up to God, asking Him why, and asking Him to tend to it, and saying, how long is it going to be this way? Rarely is that instantaneous healing, but some of the healing is found in being that straightforward with Him. The beginning of Jeremiah, God encourages him to look at almond blossoms, which he would have then seen every spring, which reminded him about the character of God. Then he saw an image of boiling water sweeping over the country from the north. These are two images that that function as guardrails for Jeremiah and for his prophecy to the nation of Israel, that God is good and we can count on his mercies being new every morning and that the world is a big mess and he's going to continue to discipline the nations in his timing and his ways. Very similar to Psalm 1 that reminds us how good it is to meditate on the gospel and the law of the Lord. And then Psalm 2 says, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? That's our reality. Those are the guardrails of Scripture. Jeremiah 1, Psalm 1 and 2, very similar. I hope that you gaze things in this world and remember God and his promises. Is that a morning dove or an owl that was hooing at us about 20 minutes ago? Jesus said we look at the birds and remember that God cares for us even more than them and indeed knows the number of hairs on our head, and that's a metaphor if you have no more hair. He still loves you and knows everything about you. And I don't have to ask what reminds you of the boiling water because One of the tendencies of humans in Eugene Peterson's language is we underestimate God and we overestimate evil. We can't see what God is doing and we conclude that he's doing nothing. We can see everything evil is doing and we think it's in control of the world. Right? Which is the reality of our limited vantage point in a fallen world. And it's why we return to God and his text and to one another and to worship so that we might actually stop misunderstanding God and evil. Even though we cannot see what God is doing, we trust him. Even though we can see what evil is doing, we know it doesn't have the last word. We know that every evil in this world is on borrowed time. All sickness, all sinful actions... Jeremiah lives at a very interesting time in Israel's history. His first 10 years are under one of the worst kings, probably, no, the worst king in Israel's history. His name was Manasseh. What he led the nation in was horrific. Sacrificing children, fertility cult in the Lord's house. Then when uh, Jeremiah was 10, a king named Josiah took over, and he knew that what was happening in the nation was wrong. And so the first thing that he did, which is good but very unkinglike, is he found the Torah. He found Genesis through Deuteronomy, and he had it read. That's what's unkingly. Let's actually do what God says and not what I think is best. And the people came back to God, and they began worshiping him again, and they began following his commandments And then they pulled back a little bit. One of the main ways was uh, in, in um, 
the law of God, when people became up to a certain point indebted, they were allowed to put themselves into slavery, not chattel slavery, but a economic system. And they were supposed to be released after six years. When Josiah had the, raw, the law read, people were so passionate that they actually did that. They released people that had been slaved. Then they did their taxes. They looked at their gross net. They thought about God a little, and they went back to slavery because it was more economically uh, advantageous to them. This is in Jeremiah chapter 34, verses 11 through 16. And this is where the message of Jeremiah is telling us, we go to God for salvation and we return to him for wholeness. Wholeness as it relates to us and wholeness as it relates to others in the world. And we, if we're paying attention, and it's complicated, this is the longest book in the Old Testament. It doesn't look like it because it's not the most number of chapters, but the most number of words. But if we, will, if we will study it and meditate on it, we'll see the twin guardrails of God with respect to generosity. What are Christians called to do with their money? It's called to be cheerful, proportionate, planned giving. And that's not just a command. It's not just based on a promise. It's also a guardrail. We don't like televangelists, right? The reason, I mean, maybe not. Some of them are fine, I'm sure. I haven't studied it. My grandfather, who I respect a great deal, came to faith through a televangelist. I'm thankful for that. But what we don't like is when they take money from people because we know that those people are probably so passionate about Jesus, they're already giving cheerfully, proportionately, in a planned way. And they shouldn't also be giving that. Don't sell your house and give your money to the church because then you're going to be homeless and your taxes are going to be a problem next year, right? Because you're going to make money on your house. My point is I'm saying this... um, I'm not trying to say it flippantly. The commands of God with respect to generosity are are not only good, there's a guardrail to them also. Where in a moment of passion, we might want to give more than we actually should. And there's a spiritual component to this also where the the people were so passionate and then that that passion didn't continue. And they made the mistake that many of us make and there's two... There are, again, two ways. One is to expect it to feel the way it felt at the beginning or the middle of our faith all the time. The other problem is to never expect our mind and our heart to deeply connect with the gospel. It will sometimes connect in beautiful ways, and sometimes it will not. But we can continue to trust God and his promises and his commands in our life. In 1997, I heard a speaker named Tony Evans, Baptist preacher, and I remember almost verbatim the end of his sermon because it just clicked. He said, it's like Rocky V. When Rocky's getting beat up and he can't get up and he remembers how he got up against Apollo Creed and he still can't get up. And he remembers how he got up against Clubber Lang, and he still can't get up. Tony forgets the name of Ivan Drago. And he remembers how he got up against the Russian, and he still can't get up. And then he remembers his trainer, Mickey, saying, get up. Get up, you bum, because Jesus loves you. Or because Mick, sorry, I ruined it. Ah. Ah. Get up, you bum, because Mickey loves you. And then he looked out on us. This was the Capitol Mall in Washington, D.C. And he said, and men, that's what Jesus is saying to you today. He's saying, get up. Get up, you bum, because Jesus loves you. The hair on the back of my neck is standing up because I remember feeling it so strongly. And that has not happened every Sunday of my life. And it's not going to happen to you every Sunday of your life. And we can continue to trust God and to follow him and to expect that in our worship of him, Sunday mornings and every other day of the week, through our obedience, he is healing us, restoring us, sanctifying us. Jeremiah 
Jeremiah 6, 16 says this, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the roads and look, and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. Does that sound familiar? Jesus is uh, loosely quoting this in Matthew chapter 11 to describe what faith in him does and is. Is the thing that gives us rest to our souls. These ways are ancient and they are the only ways that can actually give peace to our minds and hearts. Jeremiah is interpreting the moment for the Israelites and then he speaks prophetically. Talking about the past idolatries that were horrifically, horrifically, horrifically damaging. I don't like adverbs either, but I'm trying to summarize many, 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 many words. More than once Jeremiah says, and they don't even know how to blush, which is his way of being like, you don't understand how much you're violating God's holiness and harming yourself and harming one another through these idolatries. The reason, one of the reasons that that matters to us to attend to today, it is never, ever too late to heal or to repent of old wounds or old sins. You know how I know that? Because you're sitting here. When you go to be with Jesus, then it'll be too late. It's between you and him. And I don't mean too late like you're in trouble. I mean you won't need to anymore. So too late's the wrong phrase. While we're here, Sins we committed in the past, it's not too late to learn to apologize to God, ask that person's forgiveness, and then turn away from it. For sins in our past that we have trouble naming, where people have harmed us, it is not too late to hold them up to God and say, why? How long will it be until I can sleep through the night? Read Psalms 1 through 7 mainly three through seven. This is how the psalmist talked. When will it be that I can sleep through the night? Because you have healed me from this. And some of the healing comes in that very moment. And these are not the only paths to holistic healing, but for Christians, it is the most important and beginning of it. Jeremiah is speaking prophetically about the past and about the present and about the future. Jeremiah is a very visual book. So in addition to the almond tree, there's a boiling water. Um, At one point, he's told to go buy a garment and then bury it and then pull it back out and like bugs and stuff have eaten it. And the garment is what Israel is supposed to be was a garment that goes with God. But through her idolatry, that's what it actually looked like, was moth-eaten. In chapter 18, God tells him to go to a potter's house and watch the potter. And this is such a, a beautiful imagery for us as God followers. Because pottery is both useful and beautiful. But when it's marred, both things are lost. Both our beauty is made in the image of God, is not lost forever, but it's marred when we sin when we reject God and choose our own way, the world's ways, but also our um, heavenly citizenship on earth, the good we're called to do through forgiveness and work and generosity and using our words to build up and not tear down, those are the things that are lost. And he has Jeremiah take the pot and the elders and the priests come and he dashes it in front of them. And they knew, many of them knew that Jeremiah was onto something because they go to him and they listen to him. But then he's beaten for it by a man named Pasher who puts him in stocks. Jeremiah was angry at sin. He was relentless in his following of God. He grieved. He was confident. And he became very depressed about what he saw. You think I'm exaggerating. Let me read you a few verses from chapter 20. Sing to the Lord, praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the needy from the hand of evildoers. 
Cursed be the day on which I was born. The day when my mother bore me, let it not be blessed. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father. A son is born to you, making him very glad. Let that man be like the cities that the Lord overthrew without pity. Let him hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at noon. Because he did not kill me in the womb, so my mother would have been my grave and her womb forever great. Why did I come out of the womb? To see toil and sorrow and spend my days in shame. One of the encouragements of reading the Bible is we will see people that the Lord visited personally who received through faith life in him and purpose, still struggle mightily with that purpose. And then be honest with God about that. One of the lovely things about Jeremiah is how familiar he is with the rest of what we call the Old Testament because he listened to it read during Josiah's reign and he heard in it the words of life. Jeremiah speaks prophetically about Israel's past which reminds us it's never too late to learn a lifestyle of repentance and healing. Jeremiah speaks prophetically about Israel's present and there's an expectation that they repent and they never do. In chapter 34, verses 24 and 25, he finally just expresses no one ever repents. They don't pull their hair, or their, not their hair, sorry. They don't rip their clothes, which was a sign of the time. The repentance, don't worry, I'm not gonna do it here. And then he tells them repeatedly, if they're not going to repent, that's implied, then they're going to suffer exile. And that exile could go okay if they are repentant to God and one another, or it could go horrifically. And he gives them instructions for the exile that the New Testament, Paul, Peter, and the writer of Hebrews pick up on as guidance for us as citizens of heaven wherever we find ourselves. He says this in chapter 29. Part of it you see cross-stitched on pillows. You never see the best part of it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, and I'm not gonna read the rest of that because it's about the other prophets who were lying. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Do you know that that means that whatever emotions you have about politics should never get the best of you? You should have them because you're a human and watching, especially today, should fill you with all sorts of emotions. But as a citizen of heaven, they should lead you to pray especially for the ones that you do not prefer. And then move about your life confident in God and his promises. When you sense your botheredness, that's because you're a citizen of heaven and you know that this is not how the world should be. And it should free you from disproportionate anger or sadness or disgust into prayer And then Jeremiah buys a field in chapter 32. Remember I said he's a very visual prophet. And this would be like us going to the easternmost part of the Ukraine and buying a house. And I said the Ukraine, it dates me. Easternmost part of Ukraine. I grew up the Cold War when it was called the the, right? Why does Jeremiah buy a field? He doesn't have any family. He wasn't married, doesn't have children. As a symbol that the Lord will return his people. That he doesn't forget his people. 
and that he will restore them. It continues to go poorly for Jeremiah. At one point, um, the new king, Jeremiah, uh, served as a prophet under four different kings, throws him into jail, then brings him back into the king's house, starts feeding him, but wants to keep it a secret because he was a passive, weak king named Zedekiah. And then he lets someone take Jeremiah and throw him into the mud, and the text tells us that Jeremiah sank into the mud. One of my favorite things about the scriptures is sometimes we're like, I need more detail. And sometimes we're like, did I need to know that Jeremiah sank into the mud? Part of the reason he sank into the mud is one of his few friends, one of two people in the whole book that are recorded as listening to Jeremiah and actually doing what he said is this Ethiopian servant in the house of Israel who fashions together all these rags and instructs Jeremiah with how to loop them under himself and pulls him out of the muddy well where there was no water. It will, at times, be challenging for you to be a Christian person in your family. It will, at times, be challenging for you to be a Christian person in your place of business. It will, at times, be challenging for you to be a Christian person in friendship. And that's part of the reason that God tells us that Jeremiah sank down into the mud. That literally happened to him, and it will metaphorically feel that way to us. I was sitting with a friend recently who, after a legitimate, partially legitimately caused explosion of anger, ran around yelling at people. And I gently tried to encourage them, you could tell them you're sorry. And this is what my friend said. Nothing. And it felt a little bit like sinking into the mud. As we're looking at some of the longer books in the Bible, I wrestle with how much to try and encourage you to read Jeremiah. I talked about this last week. I just have no idea whether I can increase the chances of you studying it by 4 or 12%. I'll tell you this. An old friend of mine has since gone to be with the Lord. Before he was called into ministry, sold Nissans. And he said the most effective technique would be to say, you know, the Maxima might be too much car for you. Let's go look at the Altima. You know, Jeremiah might be too much for you. It might be too much encouragement. It might be too realistic. It might hit too close to home in terms of the challenges of family, friendship, hometown, and vocation. But persisting with the Lord is one of the ways that we turn away from other things and back to God, expecting him to deliver wholeness, shalom, peace. Which is what the new covenant written on our hearts, described in Jeremiah 31, is and does. It saves us and redeems us and then it gives rest to our souls. We turn to God for salvation and we return to him for shalom. In Jeremiah's text, we see this king Zedekiah, who is so weak, refused to do that over and over and over again, contrasted with the way Josiah and Hezekiah from um, other parts of the New Testament alluded to here Turn back to God. If you're familiar with Isaiah, he tells Hezekiah he's going to die. And Hezekiah rolls against the wall and prays, and God relents. And that's a model for us that we turn to God for salvation and redemption, and we return to Him for peace. We don't want Jeremiah's life, we don't want to be thrown in jail and then thrown into a well and put into stocks. But the alternative is death, a spiritual death.
through the book of Jeremiah, we see that the with God life is marked by daily, honest, emotional engagement with God and that that gives rest to our souls. Through the book of Jeremiah, we see the challenge of dealing with enemies. And let me be super clear about this. There are people in your life that are not for you. And the with God life frees us from retaliating against them into wise engagement with them. Careful. We see that with Jeremiah. He knows that Zedekiah is against him. Zedekiah asks his advice, and Jeremiah's like, you're going to throw me in prison. Zedekiah's like, no, I won't. And then he gets thrown into a well instead. You have people in your life that are not for you, perhaps at your place of business, perhaps in your family. They may not be trying to get you this way and put you into stocks. Do we even have stocks anymore? But through Jesus' teachings that Jeremiah did not know, but he knew them through the heart of God, see him wisely interacting. And also, and this is a very indirect part of the story we see him cherishing a couple of friendships one with the Ethiopian and another with Baruch who wrote down a lot of his words I believe in the one of the great gifts of the kingdom is spiritual friendship which is part of why this is important this is where we can make and then cultivate spiritual friendship Jeremiah interprets, speaks prophetically about the new covenant where God no longer, that's not the right way to say it because the new covenant builds on the old. It does not separate from them. Jeremiah interprets and speaks prophetically about the new covenant where God gives us a new heart and writes it on our heart, his love and protection and promise for us. And then we respond in gratitude and obedience and in returning to him, the full expectation of his shalom. Let's pray. Jesus, we praise you as the righteous branch that Jeremiah prophesied would come and that through your work we receive this new heart, this new covenant where your law is written on our hearts. We ask that you fill us with trust in you, gratitude, and free us into joyful obedience. Lord, the things that we need to be sad about, receive healing from and repent in our past, guide us to do that wisely without dwelling on it. Today, give us clear eyes and a sense of how you've called us not only to yourself in love, but also into purpose. And give us confidence in your future for ourselves and in the world. Amen.